me you can start now thank you so much okay thank you sonalika and um, omics logic group for inviting me and uh, welcome to all the participants and uh, i will give you a myself is sanjeev and uh, i'm the director in biocos life sciences we do a lot of computations and a uh, lot of uh, research in computational biology genomics basically and we are based in bangalore uh, about 13 years old company so with that i will uh, introduce you with very basic single cell and spatial transcriptomics and other data types <coughs> So let me start. So this is the presentation flow. Let me check my pen is working. Yes, fine. So this will be the presentation flow. I will give you NGS in JANA uh, because many steps overlap with even single cell. So I will make a background quickly and uh, eight to 10 minutes. Then I will tell you single cell, what, why and methods in analysis. Can I move it to yes. Fine. And then single cell transcriptome, uh, basically single cell RNA sequencing, and then a spatial single cell. I will give you the basics. And I will also try to get to the very, you know, uh, new ones in the field with the very tentative layman kind of explanations how it is then single cell epig epigenetics uh, basically ATAC sec which is basically adapted from the bulk uh, epigenetics protocols to the single cell then I will try if time permits to run some of the tools and give you demo and tell about them so in basic, when we are talking about NGS, uh, if you see the history for Sanger methods and somewhere DNA microarrays, some of us, we have very widely worked on them. And uh, that was the very high throughput first time. And then after that, the field was revolutionized by Illumina sort uh, sequencing, which came somewhere around 2008. Then now we are on the single molecule sequencing and single cell, which is the third generation. Now, if you see here, various protocols, uh, if you see here, these are all DNA. And there are, this side is RNA protocols. So we can analyze a lot of like variants, the targeted like exome, applicons, and then we have basically epigenetics protocol, single cell, and a lot of RNA transcriptomics and targeted RNA and small RNAs. So if we look at the whole bunch of analysis required for the uh, genetics, now if you see, this is basically a epigenetics block here which is in red. So if you see, mostly these are the regulatory elements like MNSEC, <clears throat> DNAs, PIRASEC, CHIPSEC, and then uh, occupancy of uh, you know, DNA, which is ATACSEC, which is basically assays with transposes, accessible chromatin, what is accessible. And if you see the, this side, basically this blue side, this is basically, the transcriptome uh, RNA seq. So, and you can see the transcripts, variants, and mutations. So, with the now invent of these NGS protocols, we can analyze the whole spectrum of uh, DNA from epigenetics changes to regulatory changes and transcriptome. Now, there are hundreds. In fact, more than hundreds of protocols. Now, if you see here, this is basically dominated by gene expression, RNA biology, and genome regulation. But you see a lot of small, small new protocols, like including single cells, they are coming up. So there are so many protocols are coming, which use which are using NGS. 
Now, if we see at the NGS flow, basically it is uh, three steps. Prepare your library sequence and then analyze. So it depends what is your uh, biological material uh, which you are trying to address. So it can be single cell or it can be a bulk. And the protocol uh, first extract the DNA, then library preparation matters on what is your uh, biology question and what is your material like single cell or bulk or RNA or chipc then you amplify it and then sequence like Illumina or MESEC and once it is sequenced the raw image comes and then one then after that the read comes here and these reads are aligned to the reference genome here and once they are in a and aligned then down the line when you are analyzing then you can see various you know protocol depending on your analysis rna seq transcriptome or variants or protein dna interaction epigenetics can you can infer and then downstream analysis like networks and all kind of things can be done so basically this is the ngs flow and this is a common flow most of the protocols including single cell or so these are the sequencer i'm just rushing through the briefly uh, you may be knowing all these things like illumina everybody knows uh, specific biosciences long reads oxford nano four which is also long read and there are three types actually short read long read and direct read is, has come so these are the three types of sequencing mechanisms now the what is the basic philosophy you take the fragments so these are the fragments and they are break they are broken and then they are sequenced and once you sequence the uh, these are called reads and you get the reads now these reads here you can see they are barcoded basically index uh, here in bulk, uh, you know, RNA or ChIP-seq, they are basically to decipher the samples. You can run in together and then later you can demultiplex. So this is basically, but later you will see in single cell, we will see, we will need different kind of tags. So once it is tagged, then you have the read, you can sequence from the one end or you can sequence from the both the end. So this is your fragment which was fragmented and amplified in PCR. So you can take a single end read or you can take both the ends. So you get the pair end reads. And this part basically is not sequenced. That's, that's the way the, these NGS protocols win over Sanger sequencing. Because you don't have to sequence from one end to other. And it's statistically because you have millions and millions of reads. So they cover whole genome. That's the idea where the, we are winning over cost, winning over time. Now, once you have sequenced either both ends or single end, then you get this FASTAQ file. Once you get a FASTAQ file, which has basically the four lines, so this is your read, one end or both end. If it is both end, two files will get one end, uh, read one and read two, and then you have the quality. Once you have the quality, which is spread quality, check it, and it has to be above 30, and nowadays sequencers are very much good. So even people are taking 40, it depends on your protocol, like variants, it has to be higher depth and better quality. Uh, in ChIP-seq, you can survive with the lesser one. So once you once we have got the FASTA queue and with better quality, then the next one is we align to the reference genome. This is your reference and these reads are aligned to the reference and once it is aligned you can compare like here you can see the variants so once they are compared then we can analyze variants or other protocols the other protocols are like i have told you the variant detection so you see the statistically how much is the coverage and with statistically how much is the p-value then you can see whether g's variant a is there here or not this is basically your variant detection. The other one is the RNA-seq. This is the bulk one. Then you have a say sample one and sample two. 
as you know, this is the digital compared to the fluorescence microarray. So here you see the pile, say for example, these are the 20 and the sample two, this is say three. So now if you see this is gene one, so this gene one here, uh, you can see is the expressed in sample one, but it is not in sample two, right? So <clears throat> based on the p-value, so you can detect RNA-seq. Uh, this is uh, transcriptome, the expression, gene expression. And then in chipsec, more than count, we are bothered about the pattern. If it is a pattern, then it means the protein is binding on a DNA, as you know, the transcription factors in it how the protein interacts with DNA is very much analyzed using the chipset. So the, we see the pattern. So basically the, these three kinds of protocols are mainly the applications of NGS were there in bulk. Now, as I go to the single cell, before that, let me tell you the, what is the mRNA or RNA set. This is the bulk one, just uh, to give you the background. So you have a sample of interest, disease, tumor or something. Then you have a RNA molecules, they are fragmented. Then here you see, they are basically adapters are added. They are the barcodes. And then when you sequence, so you have a read one and read two, and then you have the adapters. And once you remove these adapters, so you can get read one, and this is read two, which are aligned to the genome. And there are some complexities when you align on the, you know, because uh, CDNA when taken from, uh, RNA, mRNA, there are the breaks, which are introns are spliced out in that, that I'm not going to discuss. Once it is aligned, and then we can do the data analysis like DSEC2, then HT count and various other methods, mm, Lima and all kind of things. So you can use differential expression, variant calling, annotations, and novel transcripts and editing. Now, with this background, I have covered very quickly the NGS uh, protocols. Now we are going to go to single cell now. That's what we are um, today's uh, talk. So I hope you have you know, got the idea what is the NGS, how it is different in single cell, that will be, we will see. So if we look at the layman type of uh, analogy, suppose this is a kind of a big game, like Olympic, then you see hundreds of countries, and uh, you know thousands and thousands of players now how you evaluate a player performance and how you identify so let me say that player is like a cell so first one is pull a player out okay so that is isolation correct now once you pull a player out how are you going to analyze it now you have to tag it first one is you have to identity that is the player name, right? Then you have a country, which is its special location. And then what is the action, what he has won, that is basically his achievement, expression, in some sense you can analogically, you can compare. That is medals, what is his performance? Now you need three tags, right? One, two, and three to identify the player name, which is something like a cell barcode, which are nothing but microparticles, beads. You might have heard in single cell, there are beads where there is a cell. Then you have UMI, unique molecular identifiers. They are like a transcript, like your RNA, mRNA. And then you have a spatial location in some of the sequencing based spatial analysis. So with this, you know, layman example, how you and for anything, basically, especially in time access, any object in the nature is something like that. So we have to analyze the cells also like that. Now, cells in multiple contexts, as in previous example, I have shown you a one player. Now, if you see here, they are in multiple dimensions. They work like environmental stimuli, like you can see a blue cell here. So let's see, and it goes in cell development, cell cycle, and spatial context like a microenvironment in the tumor progression. And uh, so if you see the cell is not a static object like earlier we were you know, analyzing. 
So now, if you see here, that we are seeing the five dimensions. The first one, you have a discrete type. You have to see what kind of, of cells are there, right? So there may be a rare cell type. The other one is the continuous phenotype regulatory. So they get inflammatory and that kind of changes happens to the cell, even in they change their functionality when they are in a cancer or something like that. And then you have the temporal uh, at the time changes like stem cells, they differentiate into different kinds. So, and then vacillation when they are revisiting. So there are multiple dimensions. Then another one, once you have found a discrete types here, the cell types, then how you can map it back to the histological sections from where they are got. So that is basically a special position. As you know, it's very important like in tumor, and um, e EMT and that kind of, what kind of collagens and how they are in matrix, how they are. So e even in other contexts, it's very important. So I hope that gives you the background, like how it is important and what kind of cell multiple contexts are there and why people are trying to, you know, like single cell, spatial uh, and the uh, trajectories and all kinds of things, because that's the way in for the whole, whole functionality. Now, why we need it? Now, if you see here, as you see adipose tissues, they are made up of different type of cells. So almost everywhere you will find tissues and organs, they are very different types of cells they are made up of and they interact. So then you have a now peripheral blood that is now, if you see on this, now, if you take an average here, none of the cell is basically depicted their behavior as a by the, uh, by the averaging. That's why we cannot infer that what kind of behavior is happening. For example, let me tell you a realistic situation we faced. So a few years back, we have a project which was a brain tissue of mouse. So there was a cell. And they were dying basically in that particular disease. And there were so many cells. So let's say these are 100 and there were say five. So when we analyzed transcriptome, so this basically it was coming because it was cumulative bulk. And because the cells were individually there, you know, individually very high. But when it comes bulk, it was coming because there were hundreds and they were dying. And this was the problem basically. And that time, let me tell you, we couldn't do single cell. It's a pretty old 2008, 10 project. So that time we realized how to capture only these cells transcriptome. And today I realized that it was very important. So I hope you understand why it is needed in such uh, situations, especially brain where the, you know, the cells are very much localized in different uh, areas of the brain. So same way in the disease cases, you see, you will find a disease specific cells. Once you find disease specific cells, then you can infer what kind of, you know, you can have the targets or, you know, therap therapeutics, but it is important to decipher what kind of cells are. So the single cell analysis is enabling nowadays uh, as it is coming, uh, very much to decipher these kind of questions which we could not address. Now, single cell, it was earlier also, if we look at the traditional single cell, it was microscopy, cytometry, nowadays, nowadays it is also there. I'm just rushing through some slides because I have a lot of things to cover. So you see, uh, the, the, the challenges were throughput and number of features we can, and the cost was very high. You can see 35 per cell. $35 and $1 even. So these things can be used, but how you scale it up to the genome wide? Uh, you can analyze few cells, hundreds and thousands, but how you can million and trillion cells, how can you analyze? That is the aim basically. Now, if you see, then the single cell platform came. Initially it was 2008 when the technology clicked and 2009 basically. Uh, that was manual, Tang, that page nature paper. Then nowadays, like whatever 10X is using very much, DropSec and 10X. 
So you will see the nano droplets, uh, drop set. So these are various, and the, these things will come again and again. So I will just go through. So basically, drop set and the 10x, I will just explain some of them. Okay. So now uh, there are basically four types one is the FEX, fluorescence activated cell sorting, droplet based, nano wall, and none. So if you see here, number of cells per assay, you can compare. Here it is high actually, but um, you can see th this is basically a very much widely used in a lot of publications, DropSec and the Chromium 10X technology. So you can see here, they are basically pretty high, not at the top most, but they are used. And they are droplet based. So I will explain you some of these concepts. Uh, here it is just these methods. So what is the flow? It will come again. And then so let me just move to the next slide. It will come how it is done. Uh, it is another comparison slide if you see in drop set. So here you can see UMI and full length. So some are UMI and full length, some are not able to full length and that just three prime end or something like that. Um, let me just move. So what are the challenges before we go to you know, some of the technology, you know, technically explaining the things. Now, one first one is cell isolation. How you isolate the cell, it may, you know, change the behavior of the cell like magnetic or by mechanical force or by enzymatically. So that will change the course of the, your cell, it may change the behavior. So that is the one challenge. Another one is the amplification because you are at a single cell. So it is very small material. So how this amplification is done, that is another challenge. And the throughput, how you increase to, you know, thousands and thousands and million cells, how can you do so high throughput? So these are the basically the major three challenges, cell isolation, amplification, and parallel processing. How can you do various steps so that you can bring down the cost time and uh, on the same time, increase the throughput. Sorry, I got back. Now, next challenge is sensitivity versus. Mm, sorry. Sensitivity versus uh, how you can have the quality and quantity. So, now if you see smart sec, it is manual. Here you can cover, uh, you know, genes. I will show you the matrix, but here you will drop some of the genes, like, you know, the features, but this is high throughput. Now, the next challenge is basically at the data level. So if you see the major problem is dropout events. Other one is because of dispersion, biological dispersion, because they are very different types of cells, maybe there then high magnitude outliers may be there. But if you see, this is the one of the uh, challenge because when you see the matrix, which will come expression matrix, it is lot of zeros. So it is very sparse and your gene may be expressing, but it may be dropped out. That is the another challenge, how to meet and minimize that particular problem. So uh, with this kind of introduction and challenges and why it is needed, let me get through the steps, how it is done, single cell sequencing. So the first step is cell isolation. So there are, you can see here, you can see here, there are various ways. So you can have, you know, manual, you can have fluorescence activated cell sorting here. Then you have, you can have uh, antibody based immuno, Panning, then you can have a magnetic based, then laser mm, capture, micro dissection, and then microfluids, which is drop sec and widely used. So let me take one, which is 10x and chromium they are using. This is uh, microfluids. Now, here are two types this is drop sec, if you see here. And he's, this is high throughput. The another one is targeted, and that is PEX, smart set two. 
So let me take this high throughput. Here, this is a basic flow. So first, through the ledger, you have separated the cells. Then this is drop set and or in drop, this is 10x chromium or smart set as on previous slide I've shown. Uh, this is less throughput, but both the ends are sequenced. So you can do more things, but the, th the throughput is less. Here, if you see here, only the three prime end is sequenced and you can detect some of the gene expression and things like that. So this is the basically basic flow. Now, these are the steps and I will explain you each one of them in little more detail. So first you have a cell, I told you, then you disassociate with the cell isolation, which I have shown you on the previous slide. Then this is the drop sec. So your cell comes and your, this is the droplets beads and they will encapsulate your cells. So some are waste, like empty it will go. This is also one another problem in, you know, people are trying to minimize this. The, but the thing is your cell is come with the bead. And once it is isolated, you're like, then you have to lysis, then you have to put a barcode. On next slide, I will explain you. Once you have done the barcode, your library is prepared and it, then it goes for the sequencing. And once sequencing is done, as I told you in NGS, then you get a fast Q file of your, remember, as I told in the player example, now you see various tags, UMI, barcode, and you will see the other tags. So these tags are used later to segregate cell-wise or transcript-wise. That is the basically a main crux. So this is the drop sec, which I have told you. Now, if you see, just I will, I would like to, you know, explain you how is this uh, droplet works. So if you see, this is the bead, basically, then it has, you can see PCR handle, cell barcode, and unique molecular identifier. Basically, it will catch your transcript. So this is the droplet. Now it has hydrogels and primers. It is packed with this, this bead. Then when cell comes here, then your, when you lysis them, this is your mRNA transcripts. They will get attached to them, right? So you have three handles now, PCR handle, cell. So you can segregate cell from this and UMI, basically you can catch these particular things. So if you have cell one, two, three, four, and then your library is prepared. So that's the way in a droplet base, the B, the sorry, droplets are formed and how they capture your transcripts basically. Now this is uh, that first A I have explained you. This is the bead. Now, if you remember how you generate basically barcodes, so you can generate, there are different uh, ways like combinatorics and things like that. So 12 bases, you can generate so much and eight bases is for UMI. Remember, these are tags, unique tags. So this is the way how it is explained, like how many, which is around 65K. So you can analyze, you can tag so many cells, right? And the next one, a, this is the full flow, whatever I explained. So you take your cells and your drop, then you get, you know, captured your uh, cells with the bead, then the mRNA is, again, I'm repeating just for sake of, uh, you know, understanding the full, um, process, then it is attached to it. Once it is attached here, these are called stems, then you can do PCR and then after sequencing, you get the file. Fast -acu file your reads. Now, when you get a fast -acu file, it will, the, your reads will come like this after sequencing, then you have two barcodes, cell barcode in UMI. And this is anyway, your sequence. Now, based on barcode, cell barcode, you can segregate your transcripts in cell. And based on your uh, UMIs, you can, the finally, your matrix, gene expression matrix, for each gene, you have a cell, then you will have a count how many. So cell one, say like you have three. So 
and like you have a, here are the genes so you can see some of the genes here for example uh, you have this and you have this here so it is expressing in cell one and it is not expressing it is there the transcript is there that we have to see whether it is expressing or not so finally what you get is the expression matrix which is different if you remember expression matrix let me uh, explain on the next slide so we have come to the expression matrix so so far what i have uh, basically explained is um, what is the single cell protocols right now if we apply this is a single cell rna seq you might have heard a lot now if you see why it is needed if you have a tissue now it is a bulk expression and here it is cell wise expression as i already i told you like why it is needed when your cell specific expression is needed in certain answering some some of the biological questions so it is very important in certain situation now if you look at the um, rna seq bulk rna seq our matrix expression matrix was like this we have genes and then we have samples you know so we were telling okay disease sample non-disease normal sample whether this gene is expressing or not but we were not talking about the cell but if you see in the you know uh, single cell here you have a gene then you have cells so in this cell basically this gene is not there by this cell so these are the cells cell 2 which are responsible for gene a expression so now we can uh, basically specify like these transcripts in particular gene and these are the cells responsible so please see carefully the difference in whatever the, your expression matrix comes and this will go down the line for the analysis so there are the basically the four steps in single cell RNA sequencing, let me tell you the first one is the sample preparation, which I think we have already, uh, I have already talked about it. First, disaggregation of cell isolation and remove, separating them mechanically, enzymatically, or filtering whatever way various ways are there. Then you get the single cell. Then you use packs, droplets, and nano walls. Once you have got the cells, and uh, like I have shown you the droplets, then you add the barcode, cell barcode. Now, I hope you understand what is UMI and cell barcode, which are helping to segregate your transcripts and cells from where it is come. Now, you can have fragmentation or fragmentation, PCR, then library pre like preparation, which is three prime or five prime, or it can be full because this is 10x and there are the other protocols, 10x only, you know, sequence the three prime end. Then you sequence, it can be pair end or single end, mostly the pair end nowadays because the cost has come down. Now, the third step is once, as I told you, you get the file, then you demultiplex it cell wise, then you align to the reference genome, and then you get the matrix. Then after that, you can have the various analysis here that I will show you down the line few of them ensure it when I will show you the R code. So this is the basic flow of RNA sequencing. Now in the data analysis down, you can uh, <clears throat> special uh, tissue reconstruction. Yes, that is done from the sequencing. In fact, uh, from SCRNSF, sure it is doing. Then you can do clustering and marker identification. Uh, what is the expressions are happening, then you can have a dimension reduction and see the cells. The another one is you can see on the timeline how the trajectories of your cells, how they are propagating in pseudo time. So these are the various analysis can be done with your single cell data analysis. Now, in summary, we can say once you have a, as a bioinformatician you have expression matrix which are cell versus gene remember this is not sample versus gene as in bulk then you have a feature selection yes you have to sort out you know what are the differentially expressed and you know that's why you can see some is 
which may not be useful. You have to check it out. Then dimensionality reduction. And after that, you can see cell cell distance. You can see various things, especially map them or cluster them and networks and all that kind of things can be done. Now, this is all flow, which I have explained. Uh, so to add to that, the previous slide, uh, this is the full flow slide. Then you can have differential expressions. Then you can have cell-cell interaction networks. You might have seen in various nature and other papers. <clears throat> then you can have association, association, association with sample phenotypes, what healthy versus disease, what are the cells, and then you can have regulatory networks. Now, um, I have uh, done so far the single cell RNA-seq. Now I will show you the basic, uh, you know, various technologies and protocols for spatial single cell. This is the basic thing in emerging area, I think very much. Again, just to see the analogy, now the picture is the perfect. If you take a, your picture of your house, then you know where is what, right? So the picture is the best, um, uh, for a spatial location. But the problem is you cannot take picture of all the RNA and whole genome wide. And this is like UNOFIS or um, in situ hybridization or fluorescence based. But what we are looking at the genome wide means can we cover the whole genome? Now, if you do the sequencing, we are lost. Like we have taken from here and fill in a box. That's what the, you have taken the cells and you lose the from where it came. So what is the one basic method can be done? You tag them, basically. Now, another barcode will come, which is especially in tissue section. So we can put another tag. And once they are mixed, now I can locate from my tissue if I have a section. So I have, say, for example, this or this. I know from where it came. So that is the one of the idea, how the spatial uh, sequence uh, mapping is done basically in single cells. So we tag spatially and then we can infer them. Now, this is timeline. So if you see many here, 10X chromium, uh, they are basically dropless um, inside to capture technologies mixture. And then you see a lot of like this is uh, Marquis or uh, basically SACFIS, these are imaging based. So if you see the green ones, so um, like if you see here, in, there are some are sequencing based like star map <clears throat> and uh, like TomSec, uh, there's GeoSec here. So uh, basically four or five types of, uh, you know, uh, spatial mapping technologies and they have a some good, some bad, nothing is ideal. So it, this is a very cluttered slide. Um, just to check, um, um, yes, I'm there. Everybody is there. Hello, Sonalika. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. Yeah, yeah, you are there with me, right? Okay, yes, fine. Sir. Yeah, good. And I hope you are following, right? Okay, fine. So now if you see the spatial analysis, this is a bit cluttered slide, but it has everything. And I will uh, take slices of it to explain, but let me show you the whole uh, view. So we have a, these are the imaging based, if you see the first top left, and then high throughput cell sequencing based. And then these are the hybrid, like you take imaging profile, like Surat, it takes the um, SCRNA sec and it takes the uh, imaging profile, uh, basically the fish, and then it can reconstruct. So the, these are various kind of like in Tom sec, if you see even bulk RNA sec is used, not even single cell. And then you have the somehow the spatial data uh, triangulated in, you know, that information is embedded to that this kind of technology. So there, there are various emerging technologies which are using bulk rna seq and from, you know, that cell atlas or somewhere it is given and then how to merge, integrate data or use the drop sec 
and uh, SCRNSEC data and ISC phase source, some imaging data, and they re reconstruct the spatial location of those cells. So now, if we, uh, the basically there are four types. One is in silico, as I told you, they take the RNA sequencing, SCRNA, and the FIS data, and they try to re uh, map it uh, spatially. Now, but cannot match, coordinate, and tend to simplify. Basically, that's what simplify, and you get that kind of thing. The next one is laser capture, micro dissection. In that, you have a limitation. This is few cells you can do. Then in situ, this is an imaging based. Uh, so you have phase or various four or five times, four or five types are there. And then you have a RNA imaging. This is also, I think, pretty much emerging. Detects only targeted transcripts. So everyone has a good and some bad pros and cons. Now, if you look at it, the four types I have told you. So first you take RNA-seq. It's just a flow to just show you in the image. The previous slide, it explores the previous slide. And then you have a inside to hybridization. And then, uh, there is a suret here, which is hidden behind it. Now it will basically, you can take this part and integrate with this. And it is very easy pipeline in suret. In fact, you can explore it. The next one is basically the LCM sec and geosec based. There, you can see it is a sequencing based uh, using the barcodes. And the third one, it is amazing based. Basically, uh, this is uh, MAFIS, uh, which is basically multiplex error robust FIS. Uh, this is also pretty much um, you know, used. So this is amazing based. And the next one, the last one, fourth one is, you can see here is spatial IDs. The barcodes are added. You take the slices and you add the barcodes and then sequence. So basically the four types, the one computational methods, first one, LCM based, then RNA amazing, and then inside to sequencing methods. So four types of, now there are two things we have talked about. One is you have a single cell sequencing here. The other part, which I have shown you, this is a spatial. So now a good amount of challenges how you can integrate this data. You will see a lot of papers and how, so that you can better infer the uh, biology, whatever the questions you are inferring, if you, these two things, how they can be merged. And there's the various, uh, you know, uh, technologies. If you see here, LCM. So if you see the gene measured are very high, but if you see the x-axis is cells, and this is gene measured, okay, throughput of cells or spots. So now if you see they are very good in sensitivity, they can measure genes, but you can analyze only very less cells. But if you see the other, they are pros and cons, and these some are just computational based. These are the algorithms here, you can see. And the other many, if you are seeing these things, these are imaging based. Murphy's four, five, six, it is evolving. So uh, all kind of these technologies with plus, minus, and that kind of thing, various things are there. And this is the uh, barcoding strategy, which I'm not going to go into deep, but uh, various phase, SM phase, MAR phase, and that kind of thing, how the barcoding as I have explained to you. Now, what we have done so far to summarize, we did the bulk RNA set, then we have a single cell and we got the, you see here, we got the gene and sample wise. And then here we got the matrix. Then we have a spatial section we have taken and we have mapped either through imaging or through computationally, we have reconstructed the tissue sections with the cell mapping. So we have covered these three things. Okay, now, uh, let me get to the single cell epigenetics, SC80A cell, uh, because it's a simple one and it is adapted uh, for the single cell analysis. There are ChIP-seq and other protocols. Now, when you look at the epigenetic profile, 
you have a three regions basically if you have the chromatin accessibility then you have a protein dna interactions then you have a dna methylation basically like in cancer and things like that now if you see for chromatin accessibility you have mnas dnas pyre and new one which is atac which is assays for transposase accessible chromatin and i'm going to cover this one for the epigenetics which is adapted basically for the single cell and i will let will give you the tools and things like that now if you, here is the comparison all uh, basically the chromatin accessibility the first chip set uh, that also you can use dna's at set and uh, mnas and pyre now if you can see here no sonification is needed as it is needed here it is just endonuclease can five then you have a tagmentation so this is just a comparison slides of various uh, you know things and in fact uh, they are not exclusive they help each other you cannot answer all the questions for one protocol basically so what is atac this is assays for transposes accessible chromatin so it will uh, give you what is the chromat chromatin is accessible as you know that is what is the regulation happens so you have a this is basically uh, not uh, uh, what you say like uh, mutated kind of uh, uh, transposes nuclease five and it is like a cut and paste when it comes it will cut and paste your fragment here and that it will tagmentation so it will basically like capturing your accessible chromatin once it comes so you have barcode primers here and then you can see we have got that segment we can filter and take it out then we amplify and then you put barcodes whatever uh, you know these barcodes and umis are very important to later access the particular information or the segment what then it goes to the next generation sequencing so basically you can use this um, it i'm not talking about single cell it is basically a normal even normal now if, if you in a layman language if you can tag you can take a single cell chromatin and then you can have the like scrna set you can tag single cell here then again you can do similar thing as we have done in single cell rna seq now what is the prone uh, uh, pros of this it is very fast in fact simple and sensitive you can see three hours otherwise it takes days and it works on many cell types uh, and requires no sonification phenol uh, chloroform like pirate you and antibodies you know these all processes in chip seek or pyre or chip, they create the bias and the the last thing which is it is modified for single cell analysis which it is very difficult for the other that's why you see 10x chromatin uh, they have used this protocol the other cons is basically it is cells must be optimized if you have two less and two high cells it won't give the good performance and you can do all kind of uh, some of these uh, you know epigenetics analysis nucleosome mapping transcription factor occupancy identification of novel enhancers and deep study of the genomic profiles so um, this is somewhat um, uh, you can see in the picture basically what i have explained so here is atasec and then after that you can uh, see the picture no sorry uh, peaks here and on the with your reference genome so you can see where it is binding uh, basically where it is binding the your enhancer in something like uh, this kind of questions you can answer like suppose it is a healthy your here is your binding your enhancer and suppose the mutation happens it doesn't bind okay so you can address such disease whether see it is epigenetics and whether it is binding or not binding so that kind of questions you can answer with this kind of protocol what some of the things i'm telling you can do many other things basically now uh, till here 
uh, we are 10 minutes let me i think we will be able to finish so um, i have covered quite a few things uh, three four things now there are tools right you have suret monoclay and snap it uh, it one tool i have taken there are many actually so i will explain you quickly what can be done with these tools and how they work in fact this suret was the first and very famous and it is used so basically what they do they demultiplex and read alignment and uh, not the suret it is done by cell ranger that next slide i will explain then basically they will quantify and data filter and data normalize once they normalize then you can see the reads and cells that matrix comes once you get that matrix you can do so you see here genes and cells then you can do pca umap t sign a you know reduction you can have hierarchical clustering and then you can have marker genes detection right differentially expressed genes and which cells and things basically this is what mostly and then you have a monoclear three which gives you the dynamic gene expression in inference the trajectories rna velocity basically so the flow is the first part as you know, I have told you the fasta Q file you get from the sequencer. Then you have aligned cell barcode and UMI counting is done. Then you get the matrix. Uh, this is the very computationally intensive process and you need a big machines and the cell ranger will give you this. And I think it's freely available. Then you can use it. Then once you get the feature barcode matrix, then you can do cell identification as already we have talked, different types of cell. You can have a trajectories and uh, you can have the differentially expressed genes so suret here the monoclonal three and suret can do this in fact this suret has for uh, atsx single cell analysis also they have incorporated and in fact in, it is evolving they are adding uh, day by day new features whatever we have explained the five six dimensions so if you see in suret even uh, analysis of spatial data sets you see they map if you have availability of a spatial data set it can be mapped to your single cell rna sequencing data or chipset data then you can do other things like quality rna differential gene expressions and uh, the next one is monoclay there you can see basically the trajectory it came and this is a snap atac that um, Mm. Uh, i won't show you in the running but here you can see the main part are the others are normalization even you see in chip seek but the differentiating part for single cell is you have the clustering cell wise and this is the basically the main part peak calling uh, where the binding is happening rest is the different analysis you can see pseudo time and everything once it, you have a data single cell you can run on anything so now let me give you a, a quick demo. Okay. So, hello, everybody is there? Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Please go ahead. We are following. Yes, sir. Yes. So uh, I will just quickly share the another screen. So, where is the. So basically, this is the RE Studio, and uh, easily you can you know build. Uh, are you able to see my screen? This. Hello. Can you see my code? Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. You can see your code. Code is. Yes, so this is the basically. Let me show you the first. Sure. It. Oh, it was running. So just to save time. Uh, so basically how quickly let me show first you take the suret and this is the r studio you can install uh, i'm on uh, ubuntu 20.04 uh, so these are the some of the libraries which are used by it and it will tell so let me run a step by step okay 
So these are and then package suret if you are aware of the R and the packages. So easily and if you go in tools here and you say install packages and uh, you can just type here suret and it will come just click and say install is not that but you may uh, stuck in some dependencies uh, then you have to resolve them basically i have to go to the code directory so fine then first read the data and uh, let me tell you this data i have downloaded it is already data in that site and it comes for the cell ranger 10x data library and uh, this is like that matrix bar course umis and there are three files basically uh, which is, is going to use so uh, we have taken the data now we, uh, it has one three seven one four features you can you can look at it here if you look at it here it is showing the output here what is going to come and the figures will come in the right panel then <clears throat> so now you can see here like uh, zoom plot your data here so different kind of like various things you can plot okay so and let me see the other these are just features of how your data is scattered and things like that uh, then the first step you have to normalize the data and you can use various methods if you just see the help on this you have diff different parameters so the first step is after first step read the data which is from 10x cell ranger it comes just to summarize the uh, you know the steps then here basically the here uh, you normalize the data once it is normalized then you have find variable features basically it will find the your uh, like genes and features in that then you can see the let me just plot and i can show you uh, something like this so variance average expression it will show then after that um, you have to scale the data just to you know it will take a while it is done then you have to do the dimension reduction linear this is pca or umap it supports all here is a pca you can say umap also so it will support those various dimensional you know reductions then you can plot this is pca see here it is pca here okay which i have highlighted you can have umap and so it will show you different pc1 and pc2 it is showing two principal components if you are aware like you know dimensional re reductionality the first two three components of uh, principal component analysis they give you most of the data that's the idea actually it's something like you have a lot of data and you have segregated the main data into the one corner of your room suppose it is scattered on your house on the floor then you choose the what is the important and pile up in the one corner in a layman language i am telling you principal component analysis is something like that so it will your important you know information it will in first two three components it will segregate that's the dimensional re reductionality okay then you can see the heat map these are just you know this is pc earlier you saw the different plot it is a different plot then you have the another heat map like you know so you can see the various ways uh, this was giving some, okay i want to show you the u map just wait a while it is processing it takes time so now you can see here 
Now you have got the, your cells, basically eight types. So this is U map, right? Uniform, manifold, approximation, and projection. If you are aware of that, and mainly the U map and sinity. U map is in some cases it works better than sinity. So now you have eight clusters. Basically, these are the clusters. You can see the clusters, eight clusters here. Then you can see the cells here. The next one. Uh, now, that is the differential gene expression. It has shown the head. If you, uh, you know, no, here, let me highlight with the mouse, this one. You can see it has given you the, basically these are the markers. They are calling it not differential, basically the markers. So you see the gene list here. Then you see the log FC, P values, like you have seen in the bulk uh, RNA, seek, and the cell wise, it will be. So uh, basically that's what he's doing. Now there are eight clusters in markers, the gene, it basically it is attaching the genes. Now you can see the genes, differentially expressed genes. So there are eight clusters, uh, five, six, seven, eight. So uh, I think we, I can show this only in a two more minutes. I think we are running out of time. Anyway, we started five minutes late. Hello, Sonalika, do I have still time? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. So another five minutes. Let I want to show you the trajectory also. So uh, now you can see here. Uh, if you see the code, we we have given uh, you know we have given two genes here. Uh, CD79A and MS4A1. Now you see the expression of label in the which cluster it is. You see in the cluster three and here in this. So you can see the gene and you can see the cells in that cluster, cell wise clusters. So you can see that this gene, basically if you infer the information, so this is the gene and you will find the cluster of cells, right? This is the cluster number three. Now this gene is expressing in that cluster. So that's the way you infer that where the genes are, which kind of cells that gene is being expressed. Now, if you see the code here, um, we have given these two genes and then again, he's giving the another gene where I'm, okay. So this is the another cells now, uh, sorry, genes. Now, if you see here in the, it is expressing NKF7 in the fourth cluster very high. Remember the clusters are cell specific. So now you can find how they, so here, if you see this PF4, basically the cluster eight, these cells are responsible for the majorly expression of PF4. That's what we wanted to find out, right? So that's what you can get now here. Um, you can see, uh, you know, the other uh, heat maps means various ways. That is the violent plot. Now you can see the, you have the clusters here. I will show you the uh, one. So now you see any particular gene, you can take this one. So you can see this is in this particular cluster. So like that, you can see the heat map like this particular gene is here, this type of cells in here, LYZ here, and how much is the other place expressing? Majorly these cells, but it is expressing in this. So uh, now uh, I think you can realize like how uh, uh, we can get the cell specific information uh, from these data, um, right? So, um, cell identity clusters. So you have genes and then you have the four class. Now you can see which genes are where, how they are expressing, right? The top zero, one, two, they are set eight clusters in the other side. So what I, I want to demonstrate you that 
most of the in, the things which i have talked about is just naming the you know cells you can see here so different cell types uh, clusters eight clusters and you can see you know b b cells and k cells and cd40 like that so whatever i talked you in the uh, basically in the presentation now you can see most of the things coming here right and uh, monoclay i'll just run source it fully and i want to show you the basic you can have you know trajectories so uh, let me it takes a while uh, i can take questions by the time it the window will come if you have any please go ahead if any one of you are having some query some question you can reach me later also let me write my email id you can take s a n j double -E e v dot b i o c o s biocos at gmail.com that is my id you can you know reach me any tool or anything you have uh, uh, please let me have any questions you have or anything else whatever i have covered so far now one window will come i'll select one cell and show you the pseudo trajectory that's it it takes a while let it come anybody has any question or would like to ask something specific hello everybody is there hello sonalika hello yes sir yes sir we are here we are here there is a question that came out from uh, zahra khamas uh, mm -hmm. and the question is can we use suret analysis for bacterial cells uh yes i think you can yes sir am i audible to you yes i am yes you are yes please go ahead yes basically you can use there is a uh, i don't think in fact the data what i have taken is uh, it is some bacterial data only uh, the example what i am showing you uh, uh, bacterial or uh, some i think uh, brain but yes you can use in fact they have the data example data for it and uh, there is one more question related to sirat professor and uh, daniel asks what package uh, or what library uh, is similar to suret that can be used in python environment um actually i am not sure about python because i hardly work on that but i am um, not sure actually but uh, i don't know whether suret can be used on python or not but uh, i have no idea actually i don't work in python but i'm sure i think there must be adaptation with wrappers uh, maybe offline i can answer if you don't find or i can tell you some package which is used in python if you approach me but right now um i have no idea actually in python whether it works or not or the other packages thank you thank you professor and uh, i'm looking for any other queries please type in your questions in the chat box i will read it out to professor okay there is a question from radha krishnan and the question is uh, how is the cell sorting done using microfluidics uh, is it confirmed or validated 
and how can we know which cell type is where okay mm, so for that so let me finish this i need to go to i have uh, you know briefly covered that uh, how the in droplets basically uh, okay so just one second let me so here the screen has come so you can choose basically which one trajectory you want this has learned the graph basically so for example if i take this so you have to take the start one so i have taken the start and one i am taking so i have done now once it it is taken So, uh, if you have taken this is the trajectory pseudo time. So, I started here. If you remember, I marked it here multiple cells. Now, how it is? So, the basic you can refine it in fact much more refined it is when you set the parameters but this is the way you can see the trajectory in the monoclet 3 this is monoclet 3 uh, with this uh, let me come to that question so basically what happens in the droplet you uh, let me let me stop this so if you go to that to answer that question i hope you are able to see my ppt again yes sir so uh, basically i just So here, this is actually microfluidic device. So from one side, the cells are pumped and the other side, the beads are basically in the oil and it encapsulate the cells inside the bead. It can miss also. So the basically whatever it has encapsulated, like you can see there's a one bead, one cell type. This is cell, this is bead the another cell so different types of cells and beads are coming that's the way it encapsulate the cell in a bead basically remember the bead this is micro particle it has all the uh, basically the primers and tags and once it tags to it then only you can recognize down the line so uh, here if you see First, you take, uh, you know, no, this is basically these are like stem single cell transcriptomes attached to micro particles. And there can be a miss. Like, for example, if you see once they are isolated, and I have shown you the isolation mechanism, it can be enzymatic, or here it is through the this droplets. So now if you see this is the only useful single cell this is the one of the problem where we miss the many cells so if you see here only this is it has captured with the bead cell this is empty droplet it has to be discarded and it has taken multiple it has to be also discarded because later you cannot find from this cell it has come so it misses now the miss rate is less earlier it was high so that's the way the in the droplets Basically, you want to get this attached, this transcriptome to this, which has the primers. And like if you see here, and that's the way it is catched. And something you miss, it is miss. That's the technology, right? I hope you, I have answered. That was the, your question? Yes, sir. That, that, yeah, that answers the question. Thank you very much. Any more questions? I think that will be it. Yeah, I think we do not have any more question. Uh, 
Sure. And then, yeah, not related to uh, this topic anyway. And uh, yeah, the, the more questions related to the sessions and where to access the recordings will be answered by Sonalika later after the end of this uh, one more session that we have right now. So uh, if there are no more questions, please join me in thanking Professor Sanjeev Kumar for an enlightening and excellent presentation and demonstration on a single cell RNA analysis. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure having you here. And thank you very much uh, for your time and for, your, uh, share, for sharing your knowledge. Uh, thank you, Raghavindra, Dr. Raghavindra. And it was very nice to come here in this talk. And uh, again, I will thank all, all of you, full team, and uh, nicely organizing it. Thank you very much. So I think uh, you can take the control. Yes, sir. Sonalika. Thank you so much, Dr. Sanji. Uh, one second. Yeah, I'm back to the screen. So thank you uh, again. And uh, I will stop my video and uh, um, the mic. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. And now I would like to pass on the stage to Dr. Raghavendra to take the session ahead. Over to you, Dr. Raghavendra. Thank you very much, Sonalika. Okay, let's uh, let's move on ahead. And uh, after after a wonderful uh, um, talk on uh, single cell RNA sequence analysis by uh, by Professor Sanjeev Kumar, and I feel a little bit intimidated to talk about the same uh, topic in the context of a uh, Turbot Bioinfo platform and how this analysis is ca analysis can be carried out and and um, yeah, how you can perform such an analysis using the platform's uh, inbuilt tools. Let me quickly share my screen and let's go over the uh, topics. So uh, since Professor Sanjeev Kumar covered most of these uh, in, in, in an excellent detail and, uh, um, and with a lot of information, I'm going to, and also we are a little bit short on time, so I'm going to quickly uh, glance through or breeze through some of the um, concepts that he has already explained in great uh, detail. So uh, welcome to welcome to you all one more time. Let me share and yeah, yeah. So while you 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 had already uh, um, obtained a lot of inter, uh, introduction and information and explanation regarding single cell RNA seq uh, data uh, single cell RNA seq uh, uh, process, so let me uh, let us go through all of these. This will be a very good um, opportunity for you also to uh, summarize what you have grasped so far in the last uh, uh, one one hour or one and a half hours. So. Uh, while it might seem that single cell RNA seq is, is just a natural step forward from uh, bulk RNA seq methods, but the complexity and the heterogeneity of the single cell data, as you had already uh, gotten some information or gotten some introduction to, uh, as well as the sig significant reduction in the data quality that, that can be recorded uh, due to much less RNA material, for example, is, is too high. So as, as a result, uh, much more emphasis is placed on uh, normalization and advanced uh, statistical methods involving machine learning methods and other uh, um, dimensionality reduction methods. So let's uh, let's first understand uh, why we need uh, or how um, uh, the single cell transcriptomics is is going to be employed. So uh, single cell transcriptomics represents the profiling of all the messenger RNAs present in one cell or present in a single cell. So the most widely used technologies that is used to perform such profiling are quite different as you had a lot of introduction to how and uh, different and variety of different ways how these could be performed. So they are widely different than what it is usually uh, done for bulk RNA-seq profiling methods. So unlike the bulk RNA-seq profiling methods where the sequencing libraries are generated from thousands of cells and an average expression uh, analysis or expression data is what is generated, uh, by measuring these, uh, these bulk RNA-seq 
the single cell RNA seq technologies um, um, isolate single cells by various methods and then generate cell specific sequencing libraries by marking the RNA content from a cell with a cell specific molecular barcode. So such, uh, such a technology enables a measurement of uh, transcriptomic information for a range of thousands or even up to millions of single cells in right conditions, in correct conditions. So uh, let's go over some of the major differences between these two technologies. And that includes obviously the distribution of expression levels measured as an average for bulk, bulk RNA-seq, while uh, it is measured at the individual level for the single RNA-seq. And due to this, uh, SE RNA-seq are more suited to study cell heterogeneity, cell type identification and the differentiation of cells over time, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, so um, single cell uh, technology has been around only since 2009. So uh, it, in the context of uh, genomics or in the context of uh, um, a human genome project, which originated in 90s, this is a very recent technology. So relevant publications and protocols that is, uh, yeah, that are uh, published demonstrate how this technology has evolved and how this technology still continues to diversify because for a, for a fairly recent technology this has a really a variety of ways how this can how this uh, how this profiling can be achieved and how this uh, analysis can be performed um, so separating tissues into cells as a biotechnological or biotechnological or microbiological uh, protocols has been around for a long, long time. So for example, it's been used for cell sorting and other techniques that have been around for a long time. But the, but, the, but the differences and the advancement comes in how this single cell technology adopts this, uh, these uh, protocols to understand the state of the cell at expression level in a, in a great detail that has not been explored before. So it allows it allows to study new biological questions in which cell-specific changes in transcriptome are important. For example, uh, cell type identification, heterogeneity of cell responses, stochasticity of uh, uh, or randomness of the gene expression or pattern within the gene expression based on the cell type, and the inference of regulatory networks, uh, gene regulatory networks across the cells across the time points. So. These are very important applications of uh, single cell RNA seq uh, methods, and uh, yeah, there are the key steps that uh, key steps involving uh, single cell RNA seq data analysis is first you have to extract the cells from the tissues and isolate the cells one by one. So this is an extensive step, and that that can be executed by a variety of different technologies. And uh, Professor Sanjeev Kumar has ex um, explained in detail, and we will also go over this in a very uh, brief manner. So some steps follow a bulk seq RNA technology uh, like library preparation and amplification. These are common for both, but, but, the, uh, but, uh, but the way in which the single cells are uh, isolating the single cells uh, is performed is completely different from how uh, bulk uh, RNA seq is handled uh, when using, when, uh, when the samples are extracted and RNA is uh, uh, profiled. So, um, so we have to then perform sequencing uh, using HD uh, high, high throughput or NGS sequencing methods, and then we have to generate a structured data from these unstructured FASTQ files. And the structured data in this case will be a count matrix, and which will be employed uh, for downstream analysis and various downstream analysis, as uh, as you already had a lot of introduction to. So. Uh, So yeah, so a uh, single cell RNA-seq analysis includes uh, several steps of quality control and normalization due to the small amount of material per cell and the sensitivity of the sequencing. Uh, under, um, and uh, it is best uh, to identify unreliable data sets and it is best to exclude this from the analysis of the rest, uh, analysis uh, from the downstream analysis and uh, just use the rest of the data uh, that can be uh, normalized and that has to be normalized to be uh, to be able to compare uh, and um, and uh, yeah perform downstream analysis um, so broadly speaking 
Yeah, broadly, uh, broadly speaking, the analysis can be separated into three different parts. So first part deals with the raw reads uh, by checking the quality and aligning it to the reference genome. And then the second part deals with the cell specific data by quality controlling the cell, da cell specific data and normalizing and eliminating the artifacts. And then by analyzing the resulting data sets for differences and differential expression patterns uh, using clustering techniques and network analysis, uh, which is best suited for time course data. So uh, this is this is just a very brief summary and overview. So this is going to be a little bit repetitive. So let me brief through it. A big part of single cell RNA uh, sequencing uh, profiling is, is in the preparation of data. So how can you separate cells for sequencing? That is, that is the um, bottleneck in which, uh, based on which the single cell RNA um, sequencing technology is, is, um, is being developed. So the methods that can be, uh, the methods can be categorized into different ways, but the two most important aspects are the approaches that these methods rely on for capture of the cells and quantification of the cells. So one is the micro well method, which, uh, which uh, performs or which utilizes a series of micro scale wells that will be, or that are used to capture the cellular materials. The cells are isolated using pipettes or laser captures, and they are placed separately in these microfluidic wells. So a major advantage of such well-based methods uh, are, uh, is that um, they can be combined with fluorescent activated cell sorting techniques, and it is possible to select cells based on the surface markers and based on the differences that one can observe in the surface. And the, this strategy is very useful for situations where one wants to isolate specific subset of cells uh, for sequencing. So one of the main drawbacks in such a methods or such well-based method is that they are often low throughput methods and the material gets wasted a lot by separation and the amount of work required to get a personal um, output may, be, uh, yeah, may not be considerable. So uh, the another uh, technique based on which this, uh, so, uh, this uh, capturing of cells is performed is microfluidic platforms. So uh, they provide a more um, integrated system for capturing cells and for carrying out reactions that are necessary for library preparations. So these platforms provide a higher throughput than micro well based platforms, typically around only 10% of the cells that are captured in microfluidic platforms and thus they are not appropriate uh, if one is dealing with rare cell types and very small amounts of input. So these, these, these are the considerations that you have to take or you have to make when, when you have to choose uh, which method or which platform that you want to employ. So moreover, the chip that is used for microfluidic platforms is relatively expensive, but since the reactions can be carried out in smaller volume and money can be saved on reagents and other uh, chemicals. So the third one will be the idea behind a droplet-based method is to uh, encapsulate as, as, uh, as explained multiple times by Professor Sanjeev Kumar also in the answers, also in the question, answer to the questions. So is to encapsulate each and individual cells inside a nanoliter droplet together with a bead. So the bead, as you have been uh, explained, is loaded with enzymes that is required to construct the library. And in particular, each bead contains a unique barcode, which is attached to all the reads originating from that particular cell or from the specific cell. Thus, all the droplets can be pooled and sequenced together and the reads can subsequently be assigned to the cells of uh, cells of origin based on the unique barcodes that is cell dependent uh, or cell specific. So the droplets perform typically uh, platforms uh, typically have highest throughput uh, of all the methods that we have discussed so far, and the library preparation costs are on the order of what less than one dollar per cell. Um, but uh, while the preparation costs are very low, the sequencing costs often will become the limiting factor and thus a typical experiment uh, is where is uh, typical experiment should involve uh, a lot of coverage uh, uh, and hence uh, yeah and hence uh, the cost will shoot up in that uh, uh, in that uh, dimension so uh, let's look at some of the quantification approaches for a single cell rna techniques or yeah uh, so for quantification approaches, there are two main approaches, the full length and tag based and the former uh, the full length uh, approaches tries to achieve the uniform read coverage of each transcript because the full length is being uh, used for the, used for the uh, 
quantification, but in contrast, uh, tag-based uh, protocols or tag-based approaches capture only either the five prime end or the three prime end to which the tags are attached. So the choice of this method is very important and has serious implications in, in the downstream analysis and what types of analysis that the data can be used for. So because in theory, full length protocols should provide an even coverage of transcripts, but we will see or we shall see, or we often see that there are often biases in this uh, coverage. So the main advantages, the main advantages of uh, tag-based protocol uh, in contrast is that they can be combined with uh, UMIs or unique molecular identifiers, which can help, uh, help us improve the level of quantification that one can achieve from these analysis. On the other hand, uh, using these barcodes or using these uh, tag-based protocols to quantify the uh, genes, we are restricted to one end of the transcript. And this may reduce the mappability and it may also make it harder to distinguish different isoforms. So, yeah. Uh, so the microfluidics based single cell RNA seq can be covered in some of the major steps that we are going to discuss in, in a very, uh, sh uh, very brief uh, um, uh, few slides, two or three slides. So, first, you have to, uh, the preparation in the preparation stage, the cells are suspended to form complex tissue. Uh, from a uh, cells are suspended from uh, um, from a complex tissue to isolate these cells into uh, different cell types uh, based on different isolation methods. So the synthesis of primers using barcoded primer beads uh, that attaches uh, to barcodes of these different cell types. So that will uh, actually segregate or specify uh, which uh, cell type or which uh, read that originate from which cell type. And then, uh, then the microfluidic device uh, forms a major component uh, which captures the cells in oil droplets, uh, with, uh, which contains the uh, barcoded beads and also which contains the necessary components and enzymes uh, for, um, uh, for uh, sequencing uh, protocols or sequencing methods. So next, so uh, the, yeah, the next the barcoding of these molecules inside each cell, each cell has to be tagged by unique barcode to identify uh, to identify those specific cells during analysis methods because these barcodes will become the um, become the sequences or will become the uh, tag which will quantify those mrnas and which will uh, segregate those mrna to those specific cells so this has to be performed and uh, yeah the barcodes are added to the oil droplets uh, together with the cells and buffered which breaks the cell membranes and the mRNAs are then attached to the poly T tails of the barcodes. Um, and then uh, these barcodes are then attached uh, to these uh, mRNAs and then, uh, and then they are proceeded for sequencing. So these barcodes actually contain two, two parts. Technically, they contain two parts. One of the parts or one component is the cell barcode, um, uh, which is, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, which is uh, similar to all the molecules in one oil droplet. So in, in one droplet, we have one cell and all the mRNA molecules from that one cell will have one unique uh, cell barcode. So that identifies uh, the relationship or that identifies the source of that uh, mRNA molecules from that particular cell. And then you, we have unique molecular identifier, which will allow each mRNA prior to PCR application to have a separate barcode. So these two components will help in, I will help in first uh, distinguishing uh, mRNA molecules for, uh, for different or for specific cell types and also will help in identifying uh, biases that are introduced during PCR amplification methods. So, yeah, and then we will have to, yeah, and then the cells are lysis, lysed and cell lysis is performed and RNA hybridization is performed. So immediately after the droplet is formed, the, each cell is lysed within the droplet and its mRNAs are released. Then the mRNAs are hybridized to the primers on its uh, microparticle surfa uh, surface. And then forms uh, the stamp that Professor talked about, single cell transcriptomes attached to these microparticles. And after the mRNAs are attached, the droplets are broken by adding necessary reagents to destabilize the oil water interface and the microparticles are collected and then washed. So the mRNAs are then reverse transcribed into DNAs together in, in a reaction and they form are forming a set of beads called single cell transcriptomes attached to microparticles. These, these are the stamps in which the, uh, yeah, the transcriptomes are attached to the particles in the 
center. So, and then we have to uh, amplify these stamps and the barcoded stamps can then be amplified by PCR methods uh, for uh, uh, to necessary level that is uh, required uh, for the high throughput mRNA sequencing methods. So, so for sequencing and, ana and the analysis, the resulting molecules are then sequenced using uh, high capacity parallel sequencing and the reads are first aligned to reference genome to identify the gene of origin of the cDNA and then the reads are organized by their uh, barcodes. Yeah, and they okay, a little bit bigger. For some reason, it's, yeah. Okay. So this is how the pipeline can be initiated in the TBioInfo platform. Yes, a little bit better now. So, uh, so these molecules, uh, the resulting molecules are then uh, sequenced in high capacity parallel sequencing as you, as you know, uh, as you had uh, introduction to, and then the reads are first aligned to reference genome to identify the gene of origin of this cDNAs, and then the reads are organized by cell barcodes and the number of mRNA transcripts that uh, constitute to each gene um, for each cell is digitally counted. So this is where the UMIs uh, and the cell barcodes come into play, and this will help us uh, in uh, this will help us uh, uh, avoid a double counting of sequence reads from the same mRNA transcripts, and then this will help us build a matrix of digital gene expression measurements uh, that can be established for our or that can be um, uh, uh, leveraged for our further analysis. So to build the pipeline of sCRNA sequences on. Uh, uh, on TBioInfo platform, we can select appropriate algorithms that can be chosen based on the sequencing data that we have. The steps involved, uh, the steps include pre-processing and then mapping and assigning uh, reads to transcripts and identify cells using barcodes, demultiplexing, and then proceed forward to quantification, artifact correction, cell-to-cell -cell similarity identification, visualization. So this is, this is comparatively a long, uh, uh, a long pipeline uh, because of the necessary that single cell RNA technology uh, requires so that we should not we should uh, eliminate uh, uh, we should eliminate uh, uh, um, and normalize eliminate uh, outliers and normalize uh, the um, normalize the, uh, the expression counts or normalize the data uh, to be able to be uh, to be uh, to enable us to compare different cell types. So uh, yeah, a consolidated pipeline will look something like similar to this. And at the end of this pipeline, you can uh, submit it. And then uh, uh, this is going to give us a, a gene count matrix or count matrix, uh, which can be downloaded uh, from the pipeline outputs. OK, yeah. So when you open this file, so Technically, when you open this file, what we have is uh, um, the columns of the table that we have here are are the cells that are represented by the cell barcodes uh, in the in the in here, and in the row we have uh, genes or ensemble IDs, and uh, in the intersection we have the expression values of these genes. Each are distinctly uh, I mean of the genes for each distinctly barcoded cell types, and that are given in uh, raw count values. So the goal of the data that is used for this analysis was to identify uh, different classes of cells. This, this particular data that we are seeing here is, um, is, is used to identify the different classes of cells in the murine amygdala uh, yeah, tissue. And thus, uh, we will use known molecular marker genes that are necessary to understand which cell types are present in the table that we just uh, generated or the, just mm, the table that is just generated from the upstream analysis uh, of uh, unstructured data to structured data. So we now restrict ourselves or we now subset or select only those genes that are known to be markers of different cell types and we generate a smaller table from this bigger, larger table. And then this table is has to be technically uh, log normalized and then uh, subjected to principal component analysis, we can examine how the cells or how distinct cell types uh, are clustered, are uh, separated into um, different clusters 
uh, based on the marker gene. So this, this marker gene uh, using uh, this segregation or this separation based on the marker gene will give us uh, an overview or exploratory analysis overview of how these cells uh, separate or cluster uh, in, the, um, uh, in the gene expression count data distribution that we have. So more sophisticated visualization and dimensionality reduction techniques like TSNE and TSNE and UMAP will be able to visualize and cluster specifically distinct group of cells based on the uh, gene expression count that we have uh, obtained. And that is that forms the um, exploratory analysis and that, that forms a downstream analysis. Um, after performing this exploratory analysis, we have to move towards downstream analysis, which will be more sophisticated or which um, will involve sophisticated algorithms. So once we have the count metrics and once we have explored our data for, for the possibility and for the uh, presence of patterns within the data, then we can uh, go and, um, um, uh, and employ a number of computation methods that will help us to perform downstream analysis. And one such method is, uh, one such package is SURET. And yeah, Professor also, uh, talked about SURET. So I will tell you how this uh, can be, how this pipeline can be enabled or how this pipeline, how, how different components of this pipeline come together in the, in the single cell data analysis that can be employed in TBIOINFO platform. So the first, first few steps is to uh, create or to, in, uh, to generate a SURET object for each sample and then to check a quality control and, and select only good quality cells for each sample and then we have to normalize the data for each sample and then highly identify highly variable features for each sample or highly variable genes for each sample which will uh, which will specifically define uh, the cell types so and then we have to perform some integration and we have to scale the data so that all the uh, expression counts or all the data from multiple different uh, sequencing uh, we um, cell types are in the similar scale and then we we then um, perform linear dimensionality reduction methods like PCA and then we remove uh, 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 yeah and then we remove yeah uh, uh, not not to remove and we perform this dimensionality reduction PCA to reduce the number of dimensions that we are going to analyze with and then uh, we go to uh, remove batch effects using harmony and then we go uh, then we continue to cluster uh, key components or cluster cell types find by finding neighbors and by finding clusters and patterns within the uh, expression patterns. And then we also perform nonlinear dimensional detection using UMAP and DSNE. And that will help us, uh, uh, that will help us and identify cluster uh, uh, in the low dimensional space or, uh, or cluster in the reduced dimensional space. And these clusters can then, then uh, be assigned to different cell types based on the marker genes that we have. And then once uh, identified, once these clusters are identified and once these uh, different clusters are, distinct clusters are uh, identified from the UMAP and TSNE and other clustering methods, then we can finally uh, establish contrast uh, for which differentially expressed genes can be uh, identified and differentially expressed genes can be um, yeah, uh, quantified and we can uh, analyze and interpret those genes that are, uh, that forms or that from significantly upregulated or downregulated on the, um, for different uh, uh, distinct cell types and uh, yeah interpolate uh, extrapolate that analysis to uh, relevant biological interpretations so to select only good quality cells one has to keep some of the considerations in mind and one one basic consideration or one important consideration would be uh, the number of unique genes detected in each cells and low quality cells or empty droplets will often have very few genes. So, uh, so filtering it out based on the number of uh, unique genes will become an important uh, filter steps. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, while on the other hand, uh, cell doublets or cell multiplets may exhibit, exhibit or may uh, may uh, display uh, uh, an abnormally high gene count. So uh, you have to make sure that you have to filter out both the uh, low quality cells and uh, cells which have more than uh, or droplets which have more than one cells or fused uh, cells uh, in them uh, so that they will not uh, interfere in our uh, quantification of this uh, single cell RNA uh, analysis. So the percentage of reads that, that map to the mitochondrial genome will also become very, uh, yeah, will also be 
uh, will also have to be removed and uh, this this will uh, this will this is done due to the fact that low quality cells or dead cells often exhibit extensive mitochondrial contamination so hence uh, to be uh, to be careful and to uh, to uh, eliminate those cells we have to completely remove mitochondrial contamination for example in this case um, the percentage of mitochondrial contamination in these two cells or in these two uh, samples uh, is almost nil so we don't have to employ that filter in this case uh, and and the next will become uh, standardization or next uh, uh, the standardized variance plot uh, of uh, of of genes hmm? can you mute yourself sanalika can you help me yes thank you very much yes yeah so a standardized variance plot will help us identify a subset of genes uh, that are uh, that are um, found or that can be identified to be uh, um, expressed in a very high level from cell to cell uh, uh, in a cell to cell variance um, yes in cell to cell uh, differences or between different cells and uh, using this plot we can identify those genes and uh, and and uh, employ those genes and uh, analyze and interpret and use those genes to uh, differentiate between the cell types and differentiate between uh, how um, the uh, distinct uh, gene expression patterns differ from differ uh, among those uh, cell types and how it can be used to uh, characterize and how it can be used to explain the differences that we observe in the cell type so uh, identifying these highly variable genes will become extremely important uh, in our uh, downstream analysis and and next comes uh, after this we uh, comes um, uh, one has to perform a non-linear dimensionality reduction techniques or methods like uh, UMAP or TSME that can be uh, performed based on the top principal components uh, that is uh, that one calculates and uh, we can use this to visualize patterns in the data we can use this to cluster uh, cells that have uh, similar expression patterns and we can use this to identify differences between these clusters uh, uh, based on their uh, segregation and separation patterns. So from these identification of multiple different clusters to annotation of clusters can be carried out based on the cluster specific uh, marker genes. Excuse me. Yeah, thank you, Sonalika. So uh, annotation of clusters then can be carried out based on the cluster specific top marker genes, which is used to identify cell types in each cluster. So these annotation then after identifying or after annotating these cluster types can be transformed or transferred into the uh, <coughs> clusters that we have identified or we have uh, generated in the uh, in the UMAP or TSNE non reduction uh, uh, dimensionality reduction methods and they can be visualized to give us uh, segregation based on the gene expression distribution. So these expression patterns that govern the distinct cell types can be can also be uh, visualized as a um, as a <coughs> method or as a uh, dot plot which represents uh, simply a percentage of expression levels based on uh, multiple samples or multiple uh, cell types or based on multiple uh, genes that we have and and this give give us the uh, this gives us the um, genes that that are um, that are uh, regulated, upregulated, or downregulated between uh, different cell types. So now that we have identified distinct cell types and uh, uh, we have identified and uh, annotated distinct cell types, and we can go on to perform a differentially differential gene expression analysis between the between <coughs> multiple different cell types. And you, based on these comparisons, one can um, perform a detailed uh, or can. Um, uh, one can extrapolate that to understand the differences between the cell types and one can perform a detailed comparative an analysis uh, on the cell types uh, um, or, uh, uh, or cells from different time points. So it depends on the sample that we have. So, to, so far to summarize the analysis or the logic of the analysis that one, can, uh, one, one has to employ for single cell RNA analysis uh, techniques, let's take a look at these uh, simplified steps. So we map the reads and we get the BAM or SAM file just like a regular RNA-seq pipeline. And then we map the R codes and we produce a table of molecular counts, which is similar to 
table of expression. And then we check for artifacts and then we update the table of expression and then we normalize the data. And then a similarity matrix uh, it has to be prepared and is calculated based on the uh, molecular counts and uh, based on the cell to cell distances based on these molecular counts of this. And that will that cell to cell distances will form the basis in which we can cluster or we can perform trajectory analysis of our data. So yeah, <clears throat> depending upon um, uh, depending upon whether uh, we want to find different groups of cells uh, based on uh, whether we want to find different groups of cells uh, that is present in the sample based on the transcription profiles or uh, whether we want to analyze the cell development uh, stages or cell development uh, uh, steps over time. So clustering helps us, uh, clustering like this methods help us identify cells that are similar, that have similar expression patterns and assigning them and assigns them to a distinct group as we have already seen. This is often performed using uh, dimensionality reduction technique like PCA or TSNI and uh, <coughs> trajectory analysis is, uh, is the one which is going to help us identify, which is going to help us compare uh, cell differentiation or uh, dif uh, cells that have different expression level based on the differentiation time. And, and based on the uh, based on uh, when or uh, based on the um, trajectory of these differentiation times. So all these information analysis methods, I'll go back. Yeah, all these information analysis methods and the logic behind these methods and the choice of the algorithms that you have to employ and how to do on how to run these algorithms and how to perform the downstream analysis are discussed in much much greater detail and in very <coughs> Yeah, um, and in very uh, uh, logic-based and the modular uh, way in the omics logic platform. And I encourage you all to go through and uh, go through the lessons and check that out and uh, yeah, experience, uh, um, experience the uh, single cell analysis uh, uh, pipeline so that uh, you can develop, uh, um, develop an appreciation for, uh, for the, uh, promise and for the potential that single cell RNA seq analysis has in understanding and in answering some key biological questions that uh, bulk cell RNA analysis cannot be uh, employed for. So I will take questions now. I think most of your questions would have been uh, cleared by Professor Sanjeev Kumar also. So uh, I'll take one or two questions and then we have to move on to the next, uh, uh, we have to move on to our next um, uh, session, uh, which will also be by me. Uh, so let's see if you have any burning question in the chat box. <clears throat> what is the procedure and tools required for mapping protein sequences? Heshika, that is not related to today's session, but uh, uh, I will, yeah. Um, there are for mapping protein sequences, okay, uh, or for for analyzing or for um, uh, aligning protein sequences with one another. So there are specific threshold uh, used to remove mitochondrial contamination. Uh, <clears throat> yes, that's that's an excellent question. Uh, I, I think it depends, it depends and it changes by uh, data and one has to find out how much of mitochondrial contamination that we have. And if at all, if you have any mitochondrial contamination, then uh, it depends on, uh, it depends on our, um, judgment to leave out those samples or it depends on our judgment to uh, keep those samples so uh, if yeah you have to employ some some sort of yeah a sort of mitochondrial contamination but uh, there are uh, <coughs> and there are empirical uh, thresholds that are employed in the analysis uh, pipelines that will uh, help you out uh, with these conditions but uh, uh, in the event of specific data set in, or in the event of specific uh, um, yeah, uh, uh, tailoring to specific data sets, then you be the, we have to be the judge. And uh, this comes with experience, I think, yeah. Uh, any other queries? Do you perform DEG only on highly variable uh, genes? And now, I mean, technically it's not necessary, but, uh, <coughs> hmm. Uh, we can imp uh, we can just uh, um, uh, mention the contrast and then we can perform uh, differential gene differential expression genes and the output will be 
uh, only highly variable genes will will be come uh, will be identified right i mean it is not necessary that we have to perform deag only on highly variable genes at last how difficult it is to remove batch effects it is uh, it is actually not i mean there are techniques and there are algorithms to uh, remove batch effects and uh, uh, the the issue is <coughs> to identify or to uh, uh, characterize the differences that we uh, observe between two uh, samples as batch effects right like uh, that has to be uniformity in these batch effects based on which the based on which these algorithms work and uh, if uh, if the uh, if the um, differences that we observe between two uh, batches or two uh, two uh, <coughs> two uh, subset of sample types is not uniform or is doesn't form into any uh, any um, yeah any uh, uh, uniformity or any uh, uh, um, pattern then it is very difficult to remove batch effects in in that aspect also uh, but yeah um, uh, it 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 depends on it depends on the fact that uh, um, uh, there is a pattern to different batches that are uh, to to different samples that are uh, uh, measured uh, by different uh, users or different uh, methods so that is that is the main uh, time right um, if there is no uniformity or if the signal to noise ratio is very low then it is also very difficult to remove batch effects and we might uh, see the detrimental effects of those in the downstream analysis okay if yeah if there is no more questions then we will uh, uh, move forward and let's uh, yes okay <clears throat> so the next session for today is titled actually as uh, genomics in agriculture but uh, i will actually take the liberty to change it into omics in agriculture or into the promise of multiple omics technology in agriculture that uh, one can uh, one one will um, uh, have or one will get an introduction to from uh, from a very short uh, presentation today so i welcome you all one more time and before i even began i want to uh, <coughs> before i even began to introduce the topics and introduce different aspects of the topics i want to show you uh, the complexity of um, bringing or of considering uh, plants into omics studies or uh, the complexity that the interaction that the plants uh, as an organism that it has with the surroundings brings to the omics studies in order to the familiar omics like uh, genomics uh, metagenomics transcriptomics and proteomics and even metabolomics there are a couple of omics that we do not uh, often hear about so one of them is um, uh, one of them is volat volatilomics which is considered as a subset of metabolomics this characterizes excuse me this comprehensively characterizes profiling of high vapor pressure compounds that can be released from the plants so this becomes very important in the event of stress or in the event of other <coughs> yeah natural uh, situation for which the plants will have different uh, signature of uh, volatilomics compared to the ordinary uh, volatilomics uh, signature so similarly spectronomics is a study of photosynthetic functional traits of the plants and uh, this is used to better understand both the natural variability in vegetation function and the variability in the function in response to environmental stress and change so it becomes very important because i want to <clears throat> enlighten you that uh, before uh, before our normal methods of understanding the green fluorescence or understanding the greenliness or greenness of the plants uh, our farmers use this technique this spectronomics but not directly but indirectly by judging how green or judging the uh, fluorescence of the plants and when to uh, <coughs> when to uh, Uh, supplement it with the uh, necessary pesticide or when to supplement it with the necessary uh, irrigation pattern and this 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 study or this omic will become extremely important because not all the plants can be analyzed and not all of them uh, uh, can be analyzed in the event of mass production or in the event of um, uh, mass uh, um, <coughs> um, 
optimization. So uh, a remote sensing possibility of spectronomics is being uh, explored uh, and, and, uh, um, and the satellite, ba satellite based uh, identification of uh, different plant species based on spectronomics is also being employed or is also being explored currently. So these are all, uh, these are all very rare fields uh, which uh, require um, extremely high specialization and, and they are being currently explored in multiple parts of the world. And that's where uh, <clears throat> plant uh, omics is actually moving to. Um, so, so to give you some sense of introduction, we all, we all know that agriculture is not, uh, not only a major occupation for few nations, but also it's a way of life, it's a way of culture, it's a way of custom for majority of the uh, countries and uh, majority of the nations and majority of the continents. So <clears throat> cereals and food uh, products and like uh, rice, wheat, barley, corn and others have always been considered important food in human populations over different continents and different era. So for thousands and thousands of years, uh, people are using breeding technologies, people are using selective breeding, people are using domestic selection uh, based, on the, uh, based on the different characteristics and phenotypes of these crops uh, <coughs> with, and then based on the selective uh, uh, regulation and selective uh, breeding of these characteristics, uh, they would um, continue to breed uh, to uh, reach or to attain uh, wanted characteristics that is going to maximize uh, the yield or maximize the uh, survival ability of the plants in, in the condition in which they are uh, uh, grown for. So significant progress uh, has been completed in taste, nutritional value and productivity, but other, uh, <clears throat> pro I mean, progress in other areas like, uh, uh, like stress response or like, uh, um, yeah, uh, like uh, response to stress or response to uh, <clears throat> salinity or response to uh, high heat, which is very, uh, I mean, uh, increased exposure to heat and light and dust, which, which becomes extremely important in the event of climate change. And, and uh, uh, these areas are these, the progresses in these areas are being currently explored in, uh, <clears throat> in great detail. So last 10 years, uh, the last 10 years were considered uh, to be the new era of uh, bioinformatics and computational biology in the uh, life science section or the plant science, uh, plant life science section. So involvement of these computer science in the area of plant biology has changed the way people usually do research related to plants in, in previous decades. So groundbreaking progress in, in sequencing technology and groundbreaking path-breaking <coughs> analytical technologies that has evolved in the few last few years uh, has made uh, a made this uh, made this approach cost effective and nowadays it is extremely common for any experimental or agro based experimental lab to use uh, sequencing based methods to study and to uh, <clears throat> and to optimize and to uh, develop characteristics and phenotypes that are uh, extremely important in the um, uh, in the plant production uh, field so, so in in this uh, in this uh, 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 continuity, a comparative genomics of the uh, models, uh, uh, comparative genome, uh, genomics of the species uh, for um, between a model plant and between non-model plant can be extremely helpful in discovering organization of these genes and compar comparison between the organization of the genes with respect to each other and comparison between. <coughs> between how the information is transferred from the model crop systems, usually is Arabidopsis or usually is uh, much uh, less or uh, much uh, plant species with a lower complexity and how the uh, information and organization of this complex information is being transformed, uh, transferred from the model systems to food crop systems like rice or like maize or like wheat <laughs> in the event of uh, water crisis or in the event of salinity. So according to, uh, accordingly, uh, the use of multiple omics and the use of genomics and bioinformatics and the combination, uh, bioinformatics in combination with uh, selective breeding would likely to increase the ability of these uh, crop species to being used as um, biofuel feedstocks and therefore um, by employing these genomics and multiple omics uh, technologies in combination with selective breeding, 
will increase the use of renewable energy in the modern society and help us uh, thrive uh, better in for the uh, future challenges that we have. So <clears throat> one of the useful applications or successful applications to say that uh, that has uh, that that um, that is directly that one can directly evidence evidence from the omics um, the application of uh, omics and gene based editing uh, in agriculture is the pest control for crops using specific genes from bacillus uh, thuringiensis so <clears throat> this particular gene can help help uh, control number of serious pests that have been successfully uh, uh, e e employed and successfully uh, <coughs> tested in cotton maize and potato so when uh, when these crops get uh, these bt or bacillus thuringiensis genes inserted into their genome so they develop ability to resist or to deter uh, insect outbreak and, <coughs> and to uh, uh, and that uh, and to uh, and also <coughs> uh, resist pests that are see that seriously uh, decrease or uh, that seriously harm these uh, uh, plants and crops and thereby uh, increasing and improving the nutritional quality of these crops. Such efforts, efforts has been employed in, 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 <clears throat> in enormous scales in Western countries like uh, US, in Australia. This picture is actually from, from an Australian university which employs or which uh, published this particular result. So, yeah. <clears throat> so this... Uh, um, so such efforts and such characterization of, uh, of uh, such possibilities of gene editing is also uh, carried out in, in multiple labs in India, to name a few, NAPGR and other uh, labs in India is also exploring the possibility of uh, identifying and understanding the genetic variety of uh, uh, crops that are uh, specific to India and in comparison to crops that are found uh, elsewhere. And <clears throat> Scientists have actually succeeded in transferring genes to rice uh, to enlarge the levels of vitamin A, for example, enlarge levels of uh, supplements and nutrients that rice can provide, and to enlarge the levels of iron and other micronutrients. And this success uh, does have a deep in impact and, uh, <coughs> in, in, uh, in reducing incidence of anemia and reducing incidence of deficiency in uh, vitamin deficiency, and in iron deficiency, and even some in some extreme cases, uh, blindness that are caused in some, um, yeah, in some uh, specific uh, parts of the world. So, so another such example, uh, and this 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 comes from NAPGR example also, is is in developing cereal varieties that have greater tolerance to soil alkalinity, and uh, <clears throat> they are uh, they are also being. Um, constantly uh, up, uh, yeah, uh, explored for their ability to, uh, uh, to deter or to, uh, to grow in, in the presence of iron toxicities in the soil and these uh, and, and the variety of uh, different cereals and chickpea varieties that will be uh, that are free of aluminium, that are free of other uh, toxics, uh, toxicities and, uh, and, and, <coughs> and uh, other uh, 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 increased uh, micronutrients products uh, that are being also uh, constantly explored that are being also constantly uh, checked for. Um, so these varieties and, and, and studies in this direction actually leads uh, agriculture <coughs> to and, and leads agriculture to and expands the expands the reach of agriculture to poorer soil areas and uh, therefore adding, much more agricultural land to the global production base which uh, for which the demand is going to increase in the coming years uh, because of twofold so one fold because of increase in population and the second fold because of the climate change uh, many existing <coughs> soil areas or existing rich soil areas are constantly being converted into uh, wasteland or poor soil areas because of the uh, changes in environment and conditions so uh, uh, researches and efforts in, in such a direction is extremely important and are being uh, handled with utmost care in multiple countries, to name a few, India, Africa, Australia, uh, Europe, and etc. Cetera, et cetera. So uh, to go with the flow, another important application is in the area of metagenomics in agriculture. 
So this has uh, shown uh, extremely, uh, yeah, this, this is shown to be extremely appropriate for, um, for identifying and for representing complex patterns of interaction that is occurring among the microorganisms uh, that uh, populate the soil and also populate the plant tissues and also populate different organs of the plants. So moreover, metagenomics also showed to be extremely useful in uh, tracing or in uh, tracing or in um, in <coughs> in uh, converting uh, 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 converting the composition where one identifies the composition to be poor or where one identifies the composition to be a presence uh, will, uh, composition to be composed of uh, presence uh, uh, composition to be uh, <coughs> Uh, a, a composition that is identified to be present for virulent factors and and by transforming uh, these uh, um, meta, uh, microbial, uh, uh, microbial society within the soil or within the different uh, organs of these plants, one can actually bring back the uh, <clears throat> natural uh, defense system of the plants to fight away um, specific, uh, yeah, specific stress condition that the plants are undergoing this this is this is also uh, an extremely upcoming uh, era because this era is is already been uh, uh, underlined as metagenomics or microbial era where uh, the application of metagenomics in various uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, fields and in and their impact in various uh, uh, research areas are being constantly explored and are uh, developed and and uh, uh, methods and profiling methods and the analysis methods are being uh, constantly uh, researched on and uh, developed uh, further. So in in this respect, <coughs> one more omics that is metabolomics uh, is a very uh, chemistry based or chemi uh, uh, based uh, emerging field in the world of omics, and it is normally used to scan all the metabolites present in the sample using sophisticated uh, instruments and uh, <clears throat> and uh, and this will also this also becomes an extremely important uh, uh, field where I, as i have already mentioned uh, the volatilomics is is already grow, getting gathering a lot of uh, acceleration and uh, um, uh, and and uh, gaining a lot of popularity in the plant biotechnology uh, area so <clears throat> To, to summarize in a nutshell, uh, the goal of plant genomics is basically to understand the genetic and molecular basis of all biological process in plants. And this will help us uh, relate to this, to the complex interaction that the plant species has with its, uh, with its environment. And this will help us understand um, what is essential in allowing uh, what is essential for the plants uh, for efficient maintenance of the biological resources and in and for uh, developing a new uh, varieties that will help us uh, improve the quality and that will help us reduce the economic burden and that will help us reduce the environmental burden that we put on the soil and that will help us <coughs> expand the agricultural reach to other uh, <coughs> to other countries where agriculture is not being uh, the mm, uh, dominant uh, 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 food yielding uh, source uh, due to other various reasons. While there have been uh, successes in, in identifying uh, critical genes or, uh, and, and in identifying or introducing uh, new genes, as we had already mentioned before, uh, for uh, agrogenomic uh, improvement, the mechanistic understanding of how uh, such an effort is functioning is, is still uh, and how such an effort uh, or such a uh, such uh, um, process uh, actually helps uh, in developing or in in maintaining specific uh, agricultural phenotypes is is actually lagging because of the complexity of the plants uh, plant genome systems and plant uh, cellular system um, presence itself and the complexity that actually uh, increases uh, um, with the presence of its uh, interaction or complex interaction with its environment and and non uniform non uniformity of this interaction also plays a lot of uh, part in 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 uh, in a um, in a uh, um, 
in a consensus effort, uh, like whole genome project effort uh, uh, that, that is still lagging for uh, plant sciences. So that is, in, in this context, uh, instead of studying uh, genomics or instead of studying metagenomics or instead of studying uh, metabolomics as a, as a separate entity, uh, just like how uh, cancer genomics or cancer multiomics is being employed to understand uh, cancer and to fight away, fight off uh, <coughs> this deadly disease, there is a need to take the leaf from clinical applications of bioinformatics and multiomics integration uh, in human uh, uh, disease uh, translation science. And there is a need to uh, take that and there is a need to integrate information across uh, different hierarchy and different biological sales. Uh, scales. So as an example, uh, from left to right, we can have the genomics, genome sequence, and we can have the epigenomic marks, and we can have a uh, chromosomal confirmation of this plant, plant's genome, and we can have transcriptomics data, and we can also, we have to, and we not we can, but we have to uh, consider the plant phenotype, which, which is a subject of genetic uh, selection for uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and we also have to take the environmental and the ecosystem factors and the challenge <clears throat> in such a setup is to is to how practically and conceptually integrate all these multiple different uh, information uh, so that that information will help us uh, <clears throat> help us improve the uh, improve the plant uh, output or improve improve the uh, quality of the uh, uh, agricultural products that we are uh, actually uh, developing. So the challenge <clears throat> is there and hence uh, because of these challenges there is an exciting opportunity to do such multiple levels of data integration um, and, <clears throat> and to, uh, to include uh, some of the uh, other omics that I actually missed out like metabolome and like other uh, um, environmental data also to understand how plants and how uh, the agricultural uh, 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 product productivity uh, changes uh, depending upon these different omics platform. So <clears throat> that is that is it for uh, for the uh, introduction to um, uh, agri agri genomics, or that is what it is called. Agri genomics are uh, omics in multiple. Uh, omics in uh, applications to multiple uh, agricultural uh, efforts and uh, <clears throat> to introduce you to uh, such uh, such a system or to introduce you to genomics and uh, genomic analysis uh, in agricultural background the omics logic platform has a project uh, that specifically deals with uh, gene expression analysis and analysis of gene expression data in potato uh, to understand the genes that will uh, that forms the biomarker or that forms the basis for developing a drought resistance in specific species of potato so i <coughs> encourage and i um, uh, direct you all to go through this uh, very sh short lesson and that will uh, really help you um, uh, appreciate and understand the uh, agri genomics uh, uh, effort and agri uh, and the um, inference that one can gain from uh, applying bioinformatics analysis and applying uh, genomics analysis to uh, agricultural uh, system. So I can take some questions here if you have any. <coughs> and yeah, please type in your questions in the chat box. And thank you for your patience and thank you for your listening and looking forward to exciting discussion. Please go ahead. Are you still there? <clears throat> yes, sir, we can hear you. Yes. Do we have any questions? If yes, you can either unmute yourself and take your question or put them in the chat box. So, yeah, <clears throat> if there are no questions, then I can. I can uh, continue to uh, tell uh, some of the challenges that uh, how is a chloroplast genome is how is how is it is how it is engineered 
Okay, there are specific ways to engineer. I did not go into biotechnical uh, way in which these genome is engineered, but one can use CRISPR-Cas9 technology also. So that is the uh, upcoming uh, way in which you can genetically engineer plant sequences. And uh, one more ohm that I actually missed out is in context with what uh, Rita Mahapatra asked, which is called a plastome. So that actually sequences the um, uh, uh, chloroplast genome of the plant sequences. And uh, this brings in its own genetic complexity in itself. So generally, the complexity of uh, apply, applying these uh, <clears throat> omics data analysis to plant sequences is, is manifold. Like, uh, I mean, uh, to begin with, uh, there is not a lot of uh, a reference genome that one can uh, identify. And, uh, and since the nature of the plants and it's because of its uh, interaction to its environment and even closely related species can have multiple variations in their gene sequences and we cannot get away with applying uh, a sequence from uh, uh, one species to the other species even though uh, they are from the same genus so so these uh, these these issues are still there and then uh, obviously the issues related to repeated sequences are also there because uh, because uh, plants are uh, are are subjected or uh, the plant sequences are subjected to um, uh, a lot of viral attacks and a lot of uh, so they develop their own uh, defense mechanisms and they they have a lot of uh, jumping genes in their genomes and then uh, this will uh, translate into repeated sequences in the uh, genomes, uh, whole genome sequences and repeated sequences in the genome that is going to complicate our mapping uh, process as well. So in that event, in the last, uh, let's say, five years or six years, or even more than that, uh, long read technologies have actually enabled or actually helped uh, or actually revived uh, these um, agri-genomics effort even more. And, and in the last two years, you can see a lot of reviews connecting, uh, connecting specific efforts in increasing the number of uh, whole genome sequences that we have for the plant sequences uh, with emphasis specifically put into agricultural plants. And uh, any, any other question in this regard? Yes, yes, exactly. So I think comparative genomics is very challenging when it comes to plant genomics. You agree because exactly that's what I, I actually touched upon because because of the lack of uh, uh, or because of the lower availability of the reference genomes we are always left to um, perform comparative genomics only among uh, the known genomes or among the known varieties or with the model system which which is always not uh, a preferred case and uh, in a in a general case so uh, so uh, bioinformatics analysis have come a long way. Uh, uh, for uh, for translational sciences and translational studies that involve uh, human uh, um, samples and human uh, system, but it has it still has a long way to go uh, for agricultural in in the agricultural uh, one. But uh, remember another. Uh, I also want to point to you that I I did not even uh, describe or did not even take uh, the tip of the iceberg. The 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 data. And the potential is huge uh, because agri-genomics does not only concern plants, it also concerns the um, cattle that we are using too, uh, that we are using, and it also concerns the <coughs> um, different cycles or different uh, uh, complex interaction patterns of uh, different plants that one can uh, cultivate one after the other. So, so there, there is a lot of, uh, um, potential knowledge to be tapped on there is a lot of potential uh, information to be gained on and, and yeah and the research uh, field in this area is currently uh, only starting to blossom to say uh, in a very related terminology and any other queries in this aspect if if you do not have any questions or even yeah uh, if you have any comments you are welcome to pass it on or I can hand over the session to Sonalika now. I think is Sonalika here, so yeah. Yes, I'm here. 
Okay, thank you, Nalika. So there, uh, Swati is also uh, saying something. Could you please go through that just before Rita? Yeah, yeah, I, I told right. I, I actually uh, answered that. Right. Nice. Yes, yes, it is challenging oh, because okay. of the availability of uh, reduced availability of uh, whole genome sequences and uh, yeah. Thank you. And nice. currently, I mean, the growing area is metagenomics in in samples and uh, yeah. So that is easy to uh, capture and that is going to develop a lot of uh, analysis and a lot of technologies related to metagenomics and, and uh, not only in soil samples, also as I mentioned in, in, in metagenomic samples uh, between uh, different organs of the plants, like between the tip of the shoot, between the tip of the, between the root and between different, uh, yeah, this one. So that is also extremely fast growing field currently. So yeah, then, I, I will hand it over to Sonalika for further. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Minute. Raghav Indran. Thank you, sir. Thank you for such an amazing session. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sanjeev, as well. It was uh, very insightful. Both of the sessions were amazing. And the participants did definitely learn a lot. And uh, for everyone, I would like to thank you all for being a part of this two-day workshop. And what all we went through in these two days of workshop was just a glimpse of how we can expand more and learn more, practice more and get some good hands on with the pipelines on the server uh, in the program genomics data analysis. So the, this was just the beginning to get you all started. So uh, now the actual program that is a one month long mentor guided program, which will have nine live sessions commences on 18th of January and this program will conclude on uh, 18th of February. So this is the program page and for those who have joined the workshop uh, today and were not present yesterday, for them I just like to go through this uh, program page once again and tell you that on this program page you'll be able to find all the session details the schedule has been very well defined on the program page itself with all the session details, what all topics will be covered and also the associated online resources that includes the coursework or the lessons from the portal itself that has to be completed as a part of each of this session. And on the program page itself, if you have not registered yourself for this particular program, then you will find three different levels that includes beginner and intermediate and an advanced level. So you, you can pick the level that you would like to enroll for based on the prerequisites that are being mentioned here. So there are various resources that are being given as these three different subscription types. In the beginner level, you'll be able to definitely be a part of these group meetings that we'll be having. In the intermediate level, uh, you'll also be able to uh, have a one-on-one -on -one mentor support and an advanced level will help you get some extra time a month, uh, like an extra month to work on your independent research project. So that is the difference between these three different levels. And we also have great uh, scholarship opportunities for the participants. So if you are one of those who is seeking a good scholarship to join this particular program, then I am sharing the scholarship form in the chat box right away. Please feel free to fill out the scholarship form and reach out to Ms. Pash Thar on marketing at the rate amixology.com and she'll be able to assist you with your uh, enrollment for this wonderful program that we're about to begin with. After the completion of the program, the participants will be getting the certificate as well on their profile. And uh, the program page also lists the program courses and the project library that will come handy to all the program participants as a part of this program. So that was all about how you can enroll yourself for the program and get started with a good learning and some good hands-on with genomic data analysis and come up with an independent research project that could have various outcomes, uh, one of which could be a publication or a poster presentation and also a literature review could one of the uh, could be one of the very basics out, basic outcome for a graduate or an undergraduate student. 
So that was all that we he wanted to share with all of you. And uh, now I would like to um, leave the stage open for everyone. If you have any questions, please put in the chat box. Our mentors are here to uh, take any of the questions that you might be having. Okay, if there are no questions, then uh, I would like to thank you all once again for being a part of the two-day workshop. And we will now be meeting you all um, on January 18th when the program begins. Thank you so much, Dr. Raghavendran, and thank